Inspired from heaven, he homeward took his way, nor palled his new design with long delay, but of his train a trusty servant sent to call his friends together at his tent. They came, and usual salutations paid, with words premeditated thus he said, What you have often counseled, to remove my vain pursuit of unregarded love, by thrift my sinking fortune to repair, though late, yet is at last become my care. My heart shall be my own, my vast expense reduced to bounds by timely providence. This only I require. Invite for me Honoria with her father's family, her friends and mine, the cause I shall display on Friday next, for that's the appointed day. Well pleased were all his friends, the task was light, the father, mother, daughter, they invite. Hardly the dame was drawn to this repast, but yet resolved, because it was the last. The day was come, the guests invited came, and with the rest, the inexorable dame, a feast prepared with riotous expense, much cost, more care, and most magnificence. The place ordained was in that haunted grove where the revenging ghost pursued his love. The tables in a proud pavilion spread with flowers below and tissue overhead. The rest in rank, Honoria chief in place was artfully contrived to set her face to front the thicket and behold the chase. The feast was served, the time so well forecast that just when the dessert and fruits were placed, the fiend's alarm began, the hollow sound sung in the leaves, the forest shook around, air blackened, rowled the thunder, groaned the ground nor long before the loud laments arise of one distressed, and mastiff's mingled cries, and first the dame came rushing through the wood, and next the famished hounds that sought their food, and griped her flanks, and oft assayed their jaws in blood. Last came the felon on the sable steed, armed with his naked sword, and urged his dogs to speed. She ran, and cried, her flight directly bent, a guest unbidden, to the fatal tent, the scene of death, and place ordained for punishment. Loud was the noise, aghast was every guest, the women shrieked, the men forsook the feast, the hounds at nearer distance hoarsely bayed, the hunter close pursued the visionary maid, she rent the heaven with loud laments, imploring aid. The gallants, to protect the lady's right, their fortunes brandished at the grisly sprite. High on his stirrups he provoked the fight. Then on the crowd he cast a furious look, and withered all their strength before he struck. Back on your lives let be, said he, my prey, and let my vengeance take the destined way. Vain are your arms, and vainer your defense against the eternal doom of providence. Mine is the ungrateful maid by heaven designed. Mercy she would not give, nor mercy shall she find. At this the former tale again he told with thundering tone and dreadful to behold. Sunk were their hearts with horror of the crime, 
nor needed to be warned a second time, but bore each other back. Some knew the face, and all had heard the much-lamented case of him who fell for love, and this the fatal place. And now the infernal minister advanced, seized the due victim, and with fury lanched her back, and piercing through her inmost heart, drew backward as before the fending part. The reeking entrails next he tore away, and to his meagre mastiffs made a prey. The pale assistants on each other stared, with gaping mouths for issuing words prepared. The stillborn sounds upon the pallet hung, and died imperfect on the faltering tongue. The fright was general, but the female band, a helpless train, in more confusion stand. With horror shuddering, on a heap they run, sick at the sight of hateful justice done, for conscience wrung the alarm and made the case their own. So, spread upon a lake with upward eye, a plump of fowl behold their foe on high, they close their trembling troop, and all attend on whom the sousing eagle will descend. But most the proud Honoria feared the vent, and thought to her alone the vision sent. Her guilt presents to her distracted mind heaven's justice, Theodore's revengeful kind, and the same fate to the same sin assigned already sees herself the monster's prey, and feels her heart and entrails torn away. Twas a mute scene of sorrow mixed with fear. Still on the table lay the unfinished cheer. The knight and hungry mastiff stood around. The mangled dame lay breathless on the ground, when, on a sudden, re-inspired with breath, again she rose, again to suffer death nor stayed the hellhounds, nor the hunter stayed, but followed as before the flying maid. The avenger took from earth the avenging sword, and mounting light as air, his sable steed he spurred. The clouds dispelled, the sky resumed her light, and nature stood recovered of her fright. But fear, the last of ills, remained behind and horror heavy sat on every mind. Nor Theodore encouraged more his feast, but sternly looked, as hatching in his breast some deep design, which, when Honoria viewed the fresh impulse her former fright renewed, she thought herself the trembling dame who fled, and him the grisly ghost that spurred the infernal steed. The more dismayed, for when the guests withdrew, their courteous host saluting, all the crew regardless passed her oar, nor graced with kind adieu. That sting infixed within her haughty mind, the downfall of her empire she divined, and her proud heart with secret sorrow pined. Home as they went, the sad discourse renewed of the relentless dame to death pursued, and of the sight obscene so lately viewed, none durst arraign the righteous doom she bore, even they who pitied most, yet blamed her more. The parallel they needed not to name, but in the dead they damned the living dame. At every little noise she looked behind, for still the night was present to her mind, and anxious oft she started on the way, and thought the horseman ghost came thundering for his prey. Returned, she took her bed with little rest, but in short slumbers dreamt the funeral feast. Awaked, she turned her side, and slept again, the same black vapors mounted in her brain, and the same dreams returned with double pain. Now forced to wake, because afraid to sleep, her blood all fevered, with a furious leap she sprung from bed, distracted in her mind, and feared at every step, a twitching sprite behind. Darkling and desperate, with a staggering pace, of death afraid and conscious of disgrace, 
Fear, pride, remorse, at once her heart assailed. Pride put remorse to flight, but fear prevailed. Friday, the fatal day, when next it came, her soul forethought the fiend would change his game, and her pursue, or Theodore be slain, and two ghosts join their packs to hunt her o'er the plain. This dreadful image so possessed her mind that desperate any succor else to find, she ceased all further hope, and now began to make reflection on the unhappy man rich, brave, and young, who past expression loved, proof to disdain and not to be removed, of all the men respected and admired, of all the dames except herself desired, why not of her, preferred above the rest by him with knightly deeds and open love professed, so had another been where he his vows addressed, this quelled her pride, yet other doubts remained that once disdaining, she might be disdained. The fear was just, but greater fear prevailed. Fear of her life by hellish hounds assailed. He took a lowering leave. But who can tell what outward hate might inward love conceal? Her sex's arts she knew, and why not then might deep dissembling have a place in men? Here hope began to dawn. Resolved to try, she fixed on this her utmost remedy. Death was behind, but hard it was to die. T'was time enough at last on death to call. The precipice in sight, a shrub was all that kindly stood betwixt to break the fatal fall. One maid she had, beloved above the rest, secure of her, the secret she confessed, and now the cheerful light her fears dispelled, she with no winding turns the truth concealed, but put the woman off, and stood revealed, with faults confessed, commissioned her to go, if pity yet had place, and reconcile her foe. The welcome message made was soon received, t'was what he wished and hoped, but scarce believed. Fate seemed a fair occasion to present. He knew the sex, and feared she might repent should he delay the moment of consent. There yet remained to gain her friends, a care the modesty of maidens well might spare. But she, with such a zeal the cause embraced, as women, where they will, are all in haste, that father, mother, and the kin beside were overborne by fury of the tide. With full consent of all, she changed her state, resistless in her love as in her hate. By her example warned, the rest beware, more easy, less imperious were the fair, and that one hunting which the devil designed, for one fair female lost him half the kind. Dryden's translation from Boccaccio is worth the hearing because of his brilliant poetic skills. He shines particularly in his translations, and his rendering of the Aeneid is the only English version so far that one can enjoy as poetry. His verbal felicity was not, however, matched by any depth of conception, and his own works are unreadable today due to the vapidity of his resolutely conventional ideas. At the end of the Boccaccio, he adds considerable commentary on the ways of women, which is not in the story, and thus brought the image to a standstill. The misogyny which passed for humor in Dryden's time and social stratum, being noted, requires no further comment.